So let's talk about RESTful APIs and what REST is. I've mentioned a couple of times that it's an organizing principle that helps bring a little bit of order to the chaos of URIs and things like that. I will summarize this discussion as everything is a resource, and we'll see what that means in just a moment. But for the time being, think about a REST API call to a server as being analogous to calling a function in a program. Uh, in particular, calling a function that you didn't write, like a function in a library or something like that. So if you're just doing a regular procedure call or function call, what do you have to worry about? Uh, well, you have to name the thing you're calling, right? You have to identify the callee and, you know, which library is it and which function in that library you're going to use. Uh, so that's what operation in the library. You have to know how to pass arguments to it, uh, which arguments are required, which ones are optional, is there a particular order in which they're expected, and so on. Uh, what, how do you interpret the return value? What kind of thing gets returned? And what should your expectations be if something goes wrong? If an error happens, is it an exception? Do you get back a Sentinel value? So really, all of these same things have to be dealt with when your procedure call is actually a call to an external service. So how do you identify the callee? Well, instead of a library, we're now talking about a server that implements some microservice. And every microservice will advertise what they call an endpoint. It's kind of like a base. URI and everything, uh, all the operations you can do on it will begin with that base URI. Um, what operation, like what's the library function you're calling? What, what are you going to ask it to do? That is usually specified by the path portion of the URI, the part that comes right after the host name. How do you pass arguments? Uh, there's a couple of different ways, as we'll see, because we're going to do an example. Sometimes some of the arguments are part of the actual URI path. Sometimes they're part of that query string where there's key value pairs uh, at the end of the URI. And sometimes it's just a JSON or XML payload uh, where you're sending a big JSON data structure up to the server. So it depends on the API call. What about the return value? These days, overwhelmingly, it's a JSON data structure. We'll talk about JSON in a moment. Could be XML. In principle, it can be anything. But uh, in terms of the conventions and what people actually do, these are far and away the most common. And how do you indicate if an error happened? Well, hey, good news. We're doing all of this over HTTP. HTTP already has a way to indicate errors with all of those different error codes. So the HTTP code will indicate whether the operation succeeded. And the data structure, in case the operation fails, might contain like a helpful string or some human readable explanation of what the problem was. So what about JSON, which we've now mentioned a bunch of times? Uh, you may have already seen it through osmosis, but it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's a way of specifying a roughly hierarchical data structure that you can really think of as a Python dict or as a Ruby hash. And the primitive types, the, the slots or the values in that hash, can be strings, they can be numbers, they can be arrays with a sort of linear index that you indicate with square brackets, or they can themselves be hashes. So you, you can nest one hash inside of another, JSON and JavaScript call a hash an object, hence JavaScript object notation. Usually, a response from an API call or the payload, the data you're providing as part of the call, will be a single top-level JSON object, so a single dict, and it will have well-defined slots. And the API specification tells you which slots are necessary, which ones are optional, which ones you should expect in a reply. So <clears throat> in our earlier example, we showed a hypothetical microservice returning this Hierarch this hierarchical XML structure uh, describing a person and some attributes of the person, that same data structure in JSON would look something like that, where in this case, the only primitive types being used are the string type and the numeric type, but there is a single top-level object, and that object in this case has only a single key, which is itself an, uh, an embedded object with these other fields. Right. So super simple. That's JSON in a nutshell. So <clears throat> with those background concepts behind us. What is REST? Representational state transfer, and that will be on the quiz. No, it won't. But it's a canonical way of mapping URIs for remote procedure calls or for sort of designing your APIs. And really, the, the underlying idea is very simple. Everything the server manages is a resource. So when we're talking about an API call, we discuss it in terms like, what resource will be affected by this particular API call? What is going to be done to the resource? Are we just asking for a copy of the resource? Are we asking to make a change? Are we asking to create a new instance of some kind of resource? 
So what are the possible results of that operation and are there any side effects? And is there any other data needed to complete the operation? What would be an example of other data? Well, a lot of websites or microservices require authentication before you're allowed to do something. So somehow when you make a call, you have to specify that whatever credentials are necessary so that it knows you're authorized to make the call. Typically this would be something like an API key, but there are other possibilities. So <clears throat> what is done to the resource? Under the canonical, sort of the purest form of REST, since everything is a resource, kind of the resource exists or it doesn't exist. And so there's really only a few things that you can do. You can create a new instance of a resource. You can read, which means show me a copy or give me a copy of the, an instance of a resource. You can update it. So the resource exists, but you want to make a change to some part of it. For example, changing the name or address of our person resource uh, in the previous example. You can delete the resource. And you can ask for a list, a collection of all resources of a certain type. For example, if you use IMDb, a movie is a resource in IMDb. And a list of all the movies would be an example of show me a collection of that type of resource. In practice, you don't want to see all of them. And usually the resource commands that specify collections let you specify various filters to sort of make it practical. <clears throat> and then what about uh, doing things to resources that might have side effects? So obviously, if you create a resource, that has a side effect. The resource didn't exist before. Now it does. If you update or delete a resource, that has a side effect. The resource is now different or non-existent compared to what it was before. So in almost all well-designed APIs, uh, operations that do these side effectful things will always use either post or put. And technically, the pure REST formulation is if you're creating a new one of something, you say post. If you're updating an existing one of something, it's preferable to say put. Why? Because that makes it more obvious to the developer what the intention of the API call is. So that's a little background on how RESTful API calls are constructed, and we'll now do a real live example. <clears throat> 